Check out the Beer Zerkeradian channel for your uh, beer reviews and endless entertainment. So here it is. It looks it looks like a regular size gun just sitting there on the table. But man, when you pick this thing up, does it get any smaller than that? Impossible. It would literally be unfireable. So let's uh, let's talk about what we got here. We have the um, the FN. Baby Browning. All right, so in the history of what we've been talking about here, got to keep the energy up after that intro, huh, boy? So we have the um, Browning's um, 1911. We're going to work our way down in size, okay, not chronologically. The Pocket Hammerless. Which, uh, strange enough, we've talked about these. It's It has a hammer. It's internal, but it has a hammer. When they say hammer list, they're talking about there isn't a hammer on the outside like so. There is a... Uh, it's covered. And this thing was for your pocket. So we started getting smaller. This was supposed to be for your pocket. Now, this was the vest pocket. Strange enough, it doesn't mention anything about hammer list, but it does not have a hammer. This is striker-fired. This was incredibly popular um, for both FN and Colt. Um, it originally, this guy was originally released by FN. Um, let me pop over to some of my my info. So uh, yeah, FN originally uh, originally produced this guy, and then. Um, Colt started making them also. I have the Colt version of it. But um, I think it was 1906, because this is the this is the 1908. Okay, let me see if I have my... Where on earth are my papers? Yeah. So uh, this was the 1908 for Colt, but it was the 1906 or the 1907 for, uh, for FN. And it was incredibly popular for John Browning. It was striker fired 25 caliber. Again, as we move up, this was 32 caliber, and then of course 45 caliber. So we worked our way down. It's always cool to put these like in a in frame like that, right? But then look at the difference. Look at where we went even from here to here. We got even even smaller. Now, as much as this thing is called the baby browning, the interesting thing that stands out about this right away is that. Browning, I don't want to say he had nothing to do with it, because we're going to get into that, but it was not designed by John Browning. John Browning died in, I think it was 1926. Then in 1927 came this patent. So it was right after he died. Bang, here comes the uh, C-27. This was a Belgian patent for this gun. So who designed it? Okay. Do you donate... Wait, hold on. <laughs> Do you donate Saif? That is his name. Obviously a uh, Belgian guy. Worked for FN his entire life, this guy. Um, once again, the uh, Ed Buffalo, the, uh, the Unblinking Eye uh, website has a ton of info here on this guy and on uh, on this gun. By the way, this book right here, I hate to get sidetracked, but we're going to delve into it later. That's this book. That's Anthony van der Linden. And let me tell you, van der Linden has a ton of information on anything that's FN and Browning. Okay, but check this out. I just printed this out right from online. This Ed Buffalo stuff is awesome. 
So I read through it all. My head is spinning. I mean, I, I'm i just going to give you the important parts. and uh, But your research can be deep into what goes on, where, what was going on here. But the interesting part of it is that this... Um, do you donate Saiv... Um, worked at FN his entire life, from when he got out of school till he retired, like in the 50s, all right? This guy was around forever. And he was actually, um, he bounced around all over the place during World War I. He uh, went to England when um, Belgium was um, Belgium was uh, invaded. And even in World War II, he was working in, uh, working somewhere else. He was working in Canada for a while but was an FN employee his whole life and was actually um, their, uh, their director of operations when he designed this guy. So what had happened was he was put, he was actually Browning's assistant. And when Browning died, um, you know, a year later, uh, patents for this thing were secured. Now, you kind of wonder, this is what you wonder. You wonder when he was Browning's assistant was this something browning was thinking about doing if you notice browning never redid anything this gun that he came out with was super popular and it needed no improvement the thing was awesome this thing is or this vest pocket gun is awesome and you i'm more towards the thinking that Saiv might may have uh, wanted to produce a follow up because what was happening is this thing was getting copied. There were a million different copies of it. Everybody was coming out with their own version of it, un unlicensed copies, you know, and uh, making s certain little improvements here and there, but they probably the build quality wasn't as good. But but there were a lot of uh, a lot of complaints about this grip safety and this thumb safety because the thumb safety wasn't in a position where you could necessarily click it easily. It was kind of back here where you had to kind of take your hand off the pistol to actuate it, and you really had to get, be deep in here to squeeze this. This, uh, this grip safety. It wasn't the easiest thing to operate. It's stiff. Uh, so that was what some of the things that these copies didn't have on them. And if you notice, there's no grip safety here. And the thumb safety is more forward. Where your thumb, uh, you know, could more easily get to it. Uh, in Like in the firing position, you can take the safety on and off. So... It makes me think that Saiv, as his assistant, may have said, like, hey, look, uh, you know, this improvement, that improvement, and Browning didn't want to have anything to do with it. And, and FN themselves weren't really looking to make it. They were doing great. They were doing great with this guy. They didn't need to uh, step it up to uh, anything else. But when Browning died, this patent, this Belgian patent hit, and... Um, the rest was history. Uh, a few years later, in 1931, uh, this thing hit the market. So what is it exactly? It's a 25 caliber, six-round magazine, blowback-operated striker, fired single-action semi-automatic pistol. That's what it is. Um, now, this guy, Dioudonne Saïve, wasn't just some Browning assistant flunky that came out with a uh, that came out with uh, this gun. He worked uh, pretty hard on the um, you know and was the, the designer of the Browning High Power. And see, you, you hear this name Browning being thrown in all the time, and you're like, well, he wasn't around for that. He was he was dead. So how are you? But to FN, his name was like a trademark. It was like the guns were called the Brown, a Browning. Like, oh, you have a Browning. Like, people really didn't say, like, oh, you had an FN. Oh, they didn't say when they saw this ammo. They didn't say, oh, that's that 25 ACP ammo. It was like, oh, that's the, the, the Browning ammo. It was like, his name was like a, was like a, 
it was like how you say Lysol, you know what I mean? And um, that's the part of the reason why they weren't really trying to, they really weren't trying to act like Browning was still alive making these guns. They just, uh, the name Browning associated with these FN guns, it said Browning real big and it said FN real small. You know what I mean? That's the bottom line. They were just basically called Brownings. And um, so the Browning High Power, he uh, he also worked on to uh, to design and and I mean this guy designed the FAL. So if uh, if he needed like something on his resume to send home that he was uh, you know the right guy uh, to be the uh, the director of operations at FN, that is it. But you kind of feel bad for the guy that he kind of worked in the shadow of John Browning, sort of. You know, what I mean that no one knows, no one knows his name, and it's unfortunate because uh, the guy was good. He he was good. So they made over a half a million of these things from 1931 to 1979, and uh, they went through. Uh, they went through a whole bunch of shit. They started making them in 31. And they were very, very popular. But by 19... Oh, and then when the war hit, they kind of... Like, Germany came in and they kind of made... This is one of the interesting things about it is Germany kind of made a few hundred of them. Let's see what the, Mr. Buffalo says in here. I kind of forgot to see if I could find it quick. Yeah, so the Germans... Uh, the Germans... When they took out when they when they invaded Belgium, supposedly only made 129 of these during their occupation in 1940, and that was prior to the induction of the German Waffenon acceptance stamps in Belgium. So they don't have any German markings. Extrapolating from van der, van der Linden's data, the serial number range for these German-made baby Brownings should be 50,148 to 50,276. So for collectors, there's a little window right there to try to get the German-made uh, during occupation guns that there might only be 129 of. But then uh, right after the war, 1946, they started ramping them up. They made 10,000 of these things in 1946 alone. But then production declined. In 1953, they only made 1,374. So by 53, you could see they were kind of it was kind of dying out. But then in 53, bang, imports to the U.S. started. And then forget about it. They were off to the races. You can see the uh, production data back here. And uh, you can see that after 53, this is uh, Browning's from Browning's website that shows the numbers uh, made here or whatever. It's crazy. By 1968, they have 66,000 of these things. Made now. What happened in 1968? In 1968, they had the good old uh, Gun Control Act of 1968, which stopped imports of this gun. I think that Gun Control Act of 68 specifically listed a certain num certain names of guns, kind of like how you know, like our laws now, they'll specifically list the AK-47 specifically. That and its variants are illegal. You know, not the not the way it operates or anything else, just that particular gun they'll pick. It's kind of like what happened in 68. It wasn't so much that all small guns, I don't know if they had a size restriction or weight restriction. I think it was a weight restriction from what I've read. It was something weird like that, but they just had a list of certain guns that were no good. And, uh, and this was one of them. So this is a 68. So uh, this was the last year that they were, you know, in, importable here. And it was a, a supposedly a high production year. And, uh, huh, where else are we going? That's the patent drawing right there. I think you saw that already. <laughs> so the, um, the FN book. Let's check that out a little bit. I love this book. This is one of my favorites to just knock around. Excuse me. Knock around with. Try to get the light right where we don't have a glare problem. Anthony van der Linden. 
and mine is signed, so so there. I don't fool around when it comes to my books. No, I don't know. As far as I know, all of these are signed. So, uh, the baby browning. I was just going to show you some pictures. I wasn't going to like read you the whole thing, but he's got some really nice pictures in here. Look at how they start with just a billet. See that? Yeah, it is nice. Look at these engraved ones. Wow. Mamma mia. Yep. Yeah. Those are, uh, those are beautiful. Here, pre-68, post-68. The uh, follower has that bend to it. Uh, mine are these straight ones, so I guess they wonder what happened in 68. And then, uh, see this book even moves into the high power. This was after Browning had died. And, uh, Mr. Saeev was busy, busy, busy. All right. Let's uh, let's take a closer look at this guy. Where is it? It's not in frame. Let's take a uh, closer look here. Then we'll uh, we'll check out our snap caps and we'll uh, load it up. It has um, those really cool uh, Belgian. Uh, it has those really cool Belgian proof marks all over it, like here in the uh, on the barrel itself. And uh, up front here, Belgium, Belgium always had crazy acceptance stamps all over the place. And uh, these were the grips for the American market. The grips for the Belgian market were different. Some more proof marks down here. They're all over the place. Has a... Uh, I want to say a loaded chamber indicator, but I don't think it is. I think it's just a cocking indicator. See, it's cocked now, and if I pull the trigger, uh, it has a magazine uh, cut off, so you have to have the magazine in there. Let's see, now I move forward. So if you feel with your thumb, it's not there anymore. But we're going to see when we load it up if it sticks out further. And there's the thumb safety there. Let's... Uh, show you how uh oh yeah well, let's take a look at the snap caps for these these are the 25 caliber yes realistic snap caps does have 25 caliber examples they're friggin awesome and uh these things have a cushiony firing pin area you can see where they get hit by the firing pin right there you see that i actually use these things how they're supposed to be used and it cushions the firing pin they cycle realistically and the weight of them is realistic and uh no plasticky or paint pieces falling off inside of your firearms you know uh check out the description down below because you get 10 percent off with my coupon code my checkout code and uh there's no no shipping charge for these things so uh these things were so cheap, I bought two sets so I could have uh, a bunch of them because they're so small. I didn't want to just have a few. I wanted to have a lot. Plus, you know, with these magazines, if you have two magazines, you get two sets. You could load up two full magazines with them and, you know, actually drill cycling through one and uh, dropping that and loading another one. If, uh, you know, a backup gun, you should have a backup mag for your backup gun. Here's the, you know... Here's the other mag. They did mark these things different. See this one, it's marked on the bottom. It's interesting how they have that fold over here on, on these mags. It is interesting, right? And there were some of them. These are the earlier ones, had the FN logo on the side. And then the later ones had the FN logo on the bottom, but they all had the sight holes straight through to so you could see how many rounds you had. But you see the followers here, both of them are these straight followers. And the later ones, they they hooked, they bent over. So uh, smooth, smooth, smooth. This thing is as far as like loading goes. These these single stacks. There's no huge amount of spring pressure. So when you load them, they're just very. It's like very buttery loading the rounds in there. Feels nice and smooth. So that's six. It only takes six. 
to say only, but, uh, you know, the Daytonics was only six. So you could carry, if you carried the Daytonics and this thing is your backup. It's so really the Daytonics should be your backup. Which, by the way, let's compare some sizes. That's an interesting thing before we actually get into loading it up. Let's take a look at that. That's, that sounds interesting to me. I want to see that. So the the regular 911, uh, 1911, I always call it, I always mind up, wind up saying 911. The regular 1911 next to the Detonics, that's an interesting step down. But then if you take a look, you say, okay, the, it's about the same size as the Pocket Hammerless. So that was a really great job by Detonix to actually be able to pull that off to get a full-size 1911 slimmed down to the size of the pocket, the uh, the uh, pocket hammerless. And then here's the difference. Now you start to see what normally you would be thinking is a small gun here. Stepping down here, and then stepping down even one more time. That's crazy. That right there is crazy. This guy, Saeev, was nuts to want to go even smaller. He really was. Um, so, yeah. Let's, uh, let's get a little closer here. Let's take a look. So, the mag is a... Uh, Heel release here, but nice. It pops out, you know. And uh, cycling it is you don't want to cycle this thing with your finger on the trigger, I'll tell you right now, because with the magazine in, obviously, you need to have the magazine to load, put around in the chamber. And you're you don't really know where to grab on this thing, it's like a so small that it doesn't follow the conventional ways of where your hand ends up i mean you could conceivably hold it by the grip and have your finger in front i mean you could you know it's like you really got to kind of adjust how you handle it and you definitely don't want to have your finger it's easy to feel it you could just put your finger in here to cycle it because there's nowhere else to go but a better bet you just got to be careful you don't do any kind of slip off kind of thing into the trigger but a better bet is to go all the way across to here you take a nice high grip here and you got your finger right there. That's the best way to safely grip it because then you're underneath. You don't want to be alongside here. You don't want to be doing this when you're cycling either. Just in case you drop the slide and it sets that round off, you're, you'll take the tip of your finger off. So I like this better. This makes a lot of sense. And then we bring around the chambered. And here's something interesting about it is that can't normally cycle it as easy as you would uh well it's making a liar out of me and it's working now because i'm pretty sure i'm not a hundred percent sure where did that one go i'm not a hundred percent sure but i think the um the extractor the firing pin pulls double duty as the extractor mm, yes it does so that makes uh that makes it a little weird that, um, let me try that again. When I was first trying it, I wasn't able to. I guess, you know what, I cleaned it better, and now it's actually cycling that way. It wasn't doing that. It was hanging up, and I had to pull out the magazine. I figured it's because the firing pin is the extractor that it wasn't doing that. But now that it's, uh, I, I took out the uh, firing pin, the striker from the channel and everything like that, and now it's actually functioning that way. So you can cycle the rounds through it. Interesting, and it felt nice and smooth. What do you say we take it apart? Well, hey, before we take it apart, I just want to show you something interesting here. Take a, you know, I very rarely get a chance to show one of my uh, examples how it uh, looked when I first acquired it. But 
Take a look here at this uh, screw down here. This is after it's been fully cleaned. Usually what I'm showing you, even this, this is a, a pretty recent acquisition. When I'm showing these to you, usually it's after cleaning up. This one I got, it was in beautiful condition, like almost mint condition, let's say. But then when you get it home and you look really closer, you do see some stuff. So I want to show you something about this screw right here and what it originally looked like from then to now. So we'll take a look. I'll see you guys in a minute. Check this out. So if we take a look at this um, example here, get a real close look at it. This thing is pretty minty. And this is um, right as I purchased it. But if you really start looking close and you put like a collector's grade eye on stuff, you start to see things like that. And that is unacceptable. So we got to clean that up. Now, if we just go to take this thing apart, the amateur is just going to shove a screwdriver into that three quarters filled up slot and slip out of that screw head and take a chunk out of the take a chunk out of the screw and mess it up so before you even do disassembly it's real important to go over it so I'm going to show you, you don't really need much to fix this situation Let's set that back up a little bit, and I'll show you what we're going to add to this equation. we got a couple of different screwdrivers here. When the screws get this small, the um, type of screw, screwdrivers that you need look like this. And these are the same, uh, what is that uh, that screw head called again? That's, uh, that's for these, I, <laughs> sorry, I can't remember, but these type of um, smaller screwdrivers that look like this have that type of... Uh, that type of head and we have a sharp dentistry tool here let's see I have two I have another one that I like to use and then maybe we'll also we'll also take a look at this see these three dentistry tools here so I'll show you close up what these tips look like And a uh, trusty, rusty, been scrubbing my gun stuff for a long time toothbrush. We're going to load this up with just a little ballast ball like that. Now, let's, uh, let's zoom back in. I want to try to not shroud what I'm actually doing. I got to get my jeweler's loop. All right. Yeah, it's always good. If you can't see too good, it's always good to definitely have something to help you on the vision side of things. So now, first thing that we want to do here, just see if this, this will go to the bottom of this... Uh, slot here and uh, it doesn't really let's try this one maybe this is sharper nope see I'm getting stuck in the screw slot here I could feel it so that's not sharp enough so then we'll try something more like this all right let's see how this is. oh yeah that's good I'm getting right down to the bottom of that slot now that's what I'm talking about right there Still hanging up just a touch, like on the corners. That's a thin screw. And then we want to get rid of as much as we scraped out of there. Maybe just lube it up a little bit so we could loosen up the particles.
I'm using like a round motion here, I think, so the bristles get to go into every possible angle. Better. It looks like we could safely get a screwdriver in there. However, bear with me for a second. I'm just uh, delving into my dentist tools here. I'm try another one. I got an even. Let's try this guy. Now this way, we're able to clean it. And make it more safely removable. Now let's get, see these two screwdrivers, one is larger than the other. It's the smaller one right here that I think is the correct uh, screwdriver for this. So now we're gonna feel Oh yeah, that feels good. Man, this thing is tight. See, there's some, there's definitely some uh, rust on the threads here. Because that felt a little, I was going to do it sideways, but I'm going to have to shroud you. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to push straight down because I'm going to need to get a lot of bite on this here. Yeah, got him. Broke it free like that. Uh, this way it never would have happened, but I had to push down real hard. So I'm sorry I had to block you, but... not actually threading out of the plastic. It's actually taking the plastic along with it, but that's okay. Easy does it. That's gotta be it. What's going on here? Oh, is it supposed to be screwing out of the other one? What's, uh, what's happening here? I'm a little confused. Why is it not moving? Oh, there we go. I think it's. I think it just needs to have some. Uh, there we go. Oh, the ferrule popped out. Is that from the other side? Yeah, that's from the other side. That's fine. Interesting. So, see when we get back here. This is definitely like pocket lint right here from some uh, some guy in this. 60s. <laughs> and you can see how uh, seemingly clean, but behind the uh, behind the grip panels does hide some oxidation here and some areas that are uh, needing to be cleaned. But uh, it feels nice when you. Uh, when you clean them and you get all the way inside these areas and then you put it back together and you know that it's that clean even behind the panels. But uh, our screw here, as you can see, looks nice now. You know, I could pop it out of the plastic here and touch it up a little bit more or boil it or, you know, really pay careful attention now to it out of the gun. And, uh... That's a wrap, so back to the baby browning video. Pretty nice, right? So you see, with just a small spot like that, and the work that it would take, or the difference in what it looks like, you might not even notice something like that. This gun looked mint, you know, like in the pictures, buying it and then going to look at it, it, it looked mint. You see things like that when you get in really close, so you could imagine the work that it takes and what's involved to get a really crappy looking gun to be uh, as presentable as this. You know what I mean? You see what work, work goes into it. Whereas when you think when you think you're done, you look at it, you're like, nothing even needs to be done to that gun. It looks beautiful. But when you get close, you know, 
Now behind these grip panels is just mint perfect, not a spot of rust. And uh, again, you know, you'll have like the screw will look like that. It's a big difference. You know, if you really, if you really want to go all out. Interesting, it came with uh, the booklet. <laughs> this is an instruction book. Or, uh, yeah, I guess it is. It's like definitely a little instruction book. I love to have uh, the stuff that comes with it. It was nice of him. This seller is, is always good about uh, anything that anything that comes with the... Uh, here, it's a uh, 1968 date on this, too. Uh, he's really good about, uh, you know, giving you stuff if he gets it that comes along with the gun. Not, not only did he give me that, what else? He had a... Uh, this little holster came with it too. He's like, oh yeah, here, this comes with it. And he gives me the instruction book and gives you this cute little holster. Which is cool because, uh, you know, it snaps and it, it holds it. It kind of, this one kind of bangs around in it a little bit. But uh, it'll hold it. It's so light, it'll hold it. But what's nice about this holster is I didn't even try this yet, but I'm assuming this will work. Oh, interestingly, <laughs> you actually... Now you know that this thing is small, because I could actually say, nah, nah, the holster for it is too big for the uh, best pocket pistol, <laughs> because it is. The best pocket pistol does not fit in there. Let's try to say any of the others. The the Bayard, maybe? Mr. Bit, no, not even close. The Bayard is like, I'm a 380. I'm not going in there. The, uh, ooh, maybe the... Uh, Maybe the, uh, what do you call it? The uh, 418. Looks like it'll just make it. 418 makes it nice. So it's a 418 slash baby browning holster. So, uh, yeah, look, you got the whole crew together over here. The boys are all here. These pocket guns are awesome. They're addictive. They really are. And uh, they're super fun to take to the range. Could you imagine, you, you could take like one gun case, you open it up and you take all of these out. And these are all, and look at the difference in, uh, it's 25, 25, 25, 380. That's the thing that the Bay, that made the Bayard sick was that this thing is at 380. Anyway, I digress. Where are we going? Let's take it apart. Let's take it apart. Okay, what do we do to take it apart? Gotta get this right. I don't wanna get yelled at in the comments. So, you put the um, safety on, and you can uh, lock the slide. Excuse me for a second. All right, so uh, we had to cut the video, so I know what you're thinking. I messed up taking it apart. And I had to restart the video. And uh, that's not what happened. The people that know me on this channel know I will fumble with it for an hour before I will restart the video. I um, had a delivery that I had to go get. And that started a four-hour long excursion. So the delivery was this 25 caliber ammo. Along with, uh, wow, these are heavy. To uh, PPU 44 mag semi-jacketed fungus point. I don't know, what the hell is FJ, SJFP? 20, uh, 40 cal. To see if the, uh, I'm gonna check out to see if the old Delta Elite will cycle that stuff. I'm gonna break the rules. I'm gonna try it. Gotta try it. So then while I'm outside doing that, I bump into somebody and realize, oh, I gotta go on an errand. I forgot to do something. So then that takes me on the errand, and when I go on the errand, they go by the nearest gun store, and of course, what's there but ba -da -da -da, a Remington Model 572, 1978 vintage, Fieldmaster, which is like an 870, but it's a 22 pump in all its dusty, semi-rusty glory. Kind of feels like there's sand in that action. Not bad, but we'll... We'll straighten it out. As long as the tube is good. Oh, the tube is mint. This thing is mint. A few hundred bucks. A couple hundred bucks. Come on, how could you say no to that? And then, 
She's business as usual for me. What was next? Then on the way home from there, the uh, Roadrunner, I'm in the Roadrunner, and all of a sudden it sounds like the wheel's going to fall off, and I'm panicking. But uh, I drive home. And when I drive home, here's what I find. So we're out here in the Roadrunner, taking our quick errand, and it sounds like the wheel's going to fall off halfway through the trip. So I come back, pull off the wheel. I don't see anything, but something looks like it's missing. And then I realize that, hey, that's what it was. <laughs> the grease cap is uh, falling inside the uh, inside the center cap. The man that was making a racket. Well, that's an easy fix. Let's go bang that on there nice. So that was an easy fix. And now here we are back again, taking apart the uh, baby burning. Let's do it. So a barrel rotates. Once you put, start, should we start from scratch again? When you're, when you put the safety on, you could put the slide back, put the safety on, it'll fall into a notch right there. That's like the takedown notch. And you see how you could rotate the barrel here? So you ready to take the barrel that gets the barrel lugs out of there. I'm not 100% sure if we pull the trigger. Let's uh, go back and make sure. Because we did not, you have to pull the trigger. You have to relax the striker. Otherwise, when you take the slide off, the striker could go shooting across the room. It's like, it's like charged in there up against the sear. So we turn the barrel, and then we take this off and the whole slide will just come off so this is pretty cool we got our like recoil spring in here it's like a, du a dual recoil spring a spring and a spring which we're seeing more and more are strange here's the, uh, the lugs that the barrel go in let's pull the barrel out of here for you this is the lugs that the barrel sit in this was the only thing that was retained from the uh, Colt 190 six or seven or eight the Colt 1908 sorry it would be the FN six or seven and then the rest of it was um what was it where did I put the paperwork the rest of the gun was supposedly designed after the Walther model nine so you see that's something that I'm gonna have to delve into now apparently this guy kind of borrowed heavily from the Walther model nine and in here we have the striker. Here's the indicator that pops out the back there. Oh, we forgot to check to see if it's just a cocking indicator or a... Here's the uh, striker. Fits in there nice and snug. Huh? There it is. So there's the firing pin technically or striker. Rides in a channel here with that keyway. I want to check to see if this sticks out the same amount, whether it's... Because maybe when around this chamber... No, nah, I don't think... Well, this isn't all the way forward. I think this is supposed to sit all the way forward. There we go, like that. And then maybe when around this chamber, it pushes that back. Not just that it's charged. No, I think it's just that it's charged. I don't think it sticks out any further. Because I think then that's up against the sear and that's it. I don't think the round in there pushes it back any further. But let's uh, back up a little bit, sorry. Yeah, so that's most of the disassembly. It's just a, it's a simple design, ain't it? So now the easiest way to do this is put the barrel in here first. And rotate it into its uh, little hiding position there which would be right there. Then put the slide on and make sure that's in there. Make sure that the front, that the recoil spring is in that hole. And then you just pull it back and lock it back into place again. Rotate the barrel back into place. And boom, we good. Like that, we disassembled and reassembled it. Yay. Oh, let's check that now. So, with... 
Hmm. Nothing. I got nothing with it. Uh, with it just charged. But then with the round inside, then I feel it. I feel it. Sorry. I feel it sticking out there with a the round with a round in there. Now without that round, it's still there. Now it moved forward. Now it's back again. Why wasn't it there before when I cycled the action? Oh, because I pulled the trigger with the magazine out, so I don't think it actually dropped. Who knows? Let's see. Magazine in. Drops forward. Cycle it. It sticks out just as far whether there's a round in there or not. It doesn't know from around. It just knows that it's charged. So it's not a loaded chamber indicator. It's a charge striker indicator basically so that's that ladies and gentlemen that is the baby browning if i forgot anything i will uh be sure to hate myself um don't forget about the realistic snap caps here these things are awesome even 25 caliber look at them here the this pile of them you could get this really wasn't a lot of money i mean i don't want to quote because i don't have it up on the screen but it's like in the teens or something, a pack of seven of these, 13, 15, something like that. No shipping. Then you get 10% off with my coupon code. Forget about it. How could you say no? I think you pay more for those plastic garbage ones in the gun store that you only get like two of at a time. What kind of craziness is that? Realisticsnapcaps.com. Check them out. Mill Surf Garage is the coupon code. Check down in the description down there. And, uh... Beer Zerkeradian, thank you for your tunes and for your endless enjoyment on your Beer Zerkeradian channel. I suggest checking them out. And I will see you all next time. Yes. <laughs> Beer